Continuing our study of Revelation chapter 1, this is our last study of Revelation chapter 1. Can you believe it? We made it all the way to verse 20. We've done a lot of teachings on Revelation chapter 1. It has been so much material, so dense. Uh, it's been so awesome learning all the things that I've learned. Hopefully you've all learned some things as well. So today let's finish out chapter 1 and that is going to be by looking at verse 20 which says... And this is Jesus speaking. He says to John, This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So commenting on the word mystery, Fanning says, quote, The particular sense of mystery in this verse is seen in its usage eight times in Daniel 2, 18-47 where the symbolic meaning or interpretation of what the king has seen in his dream is revealed to Daniel. As in Daniel 2, the interpretation involves identifying the referent of the symbols. This is what they represent, or this is what they signify. Sometimes the referents are quite specific, and sometimes they are more general, but still concrete entities. And, Fanning, and that's the end of Fanning's quote, and he's specifically talking there about Daniel, when he says sometimes they are more general but still concrete entities, that's uh, Fanning talking about Daniel chapter 2 when Daniel reveals the kingdoms to Nebuchadnezzar in the statue. Um, he's not talking about concrete entities like um, supernatural beings or anything like that. He's talking specifically there about Daniel 2 and the statue of Nebuchadnezzar representing a kingdom. So that's why he's saying it's more general but it's still you know a concrete thing. It's still representing something that actually exists. And Grant Osborne says, quote, Mystery is a critical apocalyptic concept. It refers to hidden secrets kept from the people of the past, but now disclosed by God. Mystery is also used, uh, sorry, that's the end of the Osborne quote. A mystery is also used three times in First Enoch where it introduces eschatological scenarios. And Paul uses the term similarly in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Justin Martyr also used the word as a synonym for symbol or symbolic. Fanning says, quote, Stand, Christ standing in the middle of the lampstands, that is the churches, in verse 13 and 20, is a significant image of his close concern and relationship with these congregations and of their role as witnesses to God's truth. He is not distant even in his glorified present condition. He knows their triumphs and their failures as they try to represent God in the world. Because he is vitally connected to them right in their midst. The fact that he holds the seven stars, that is the angels of the churches in his right hand, denotes his authority and control over them, end quote. So that's le this leads us into trying to identify these seven angels. The angels of the churches. What does that mean? Who, who are these angels? And this is a topic of great debate. David Ahn says, quote, Determining the identity of these angels continues to be a major problem in the interpretation of Revelation. The term angelos, like the Hebrew malach, means messenger and may refer to a supernatural being or a human being. The term angelos occurs 77 times in Revelation and only in chapter 120 through 322 is the term used for the angels of the seven churches. Elsewhere in Revelation, angelos is used of supernatural beings serving as messengers or, angel, or agents of God. Most scholars presume that the eight problematic references must also refer to beneficent supernatural beings. The argument is flawed, however, since it is assuming in the premise of an argument the conclusion that is still to be proved. No single solution is without problems, end quote. So I appreciated the honesty there of on. It's a tough question, and many people are very opinionated about it. I'm sure some of you listening have pretty strong opinions one way or another about this. Uh, so we'll go, through, we'll go through the scholarship here, and I'm actually, myself, I'm going to end up in the minority, but we'll go through this here. So first up, Bollinger always uh, very strongly opinionated. He says, quote, 
who shall authorize us to understand the word angels as having any connection with the church of God? No one ever heard until quite recent times of such a title being given to any church officer, either in scripture, in history, or in tradition. To take the word angel as meaning bishop in the absence of any evidence of any kind is one of the vagaries of interpretation of which the apocalypse has so long suffered, end quote. So when he said at the beginning of that quote, who shall authorize us to understand the word angels as having any connection with the church of God, he's not going against what Jesus told John. He said the angels of the churches. Um, he said the, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Clearly, you know, the angels are angels of the churches. But what he's pushing against is that he does not want to identify the angels as a, a person of authority within the church. That's what he said when he, when he was talking about the bishops or um, church officers. So very strongly opinionated Bullinger. Uh, Beale, quote, The reference to angels has been variously identified as, one, heavenly beings, two, heavenly beings who are representatives of or guardians over the churches, so that the churches are also in mind. Three, human leaders or representatives of the churches. Four, personifications of the prevailing spirit or character of the churches. So let me break in here. On suggests the possibility that the angels are visionary counterparts of the community prophets. So I think that would fit in with Beale's number four. Uh, but Beale doesn't specifically have that as an option. So I, like I said, I think that would fit as a subcategory of Beale's number four. So back to Beale. Quote, the observation that angel refers without exception to heavenly beings in the visionary portion of Revelation points to the same identification here. These angels could be identified with the seven archangels known to Jewish tradition, though this is far from certain, end quote. And Fanning says, quote, the word angel denotes a supernatural being elsewhere, everywhere else in Revelation, referring usually to a holy angel, but at times to a demonic being. He goes on to say, symbolizing an angel as a star occurs in chapter 9, verse 1, also, Judges 5.20, so let me break it in here. There's another reference back to Judges. Remember from our previous study, we looked at Judges 5.20 and 31. So here it comes up again. And Fanning also links to Job 38.7, which I also think we quoted in that previous study as well. So Fanning continues, quote, In general, angels appear frequently in apocalyptic literature and in Revelation itself. So readers would more likely expect the term to mean angel rather than messenger. Angels are viewed as guardians or representatives for individual humans or for earthly nations, and they seem to be attentive to the life of the church. End quote. So the angels seem to be addressed as if each angel is the specific church, but this is problematic since the lampstands are said to be the churches. And also, as Osborne points out, quote, the primary objection to this is that the letters of the next two chapters addresses the problems of the churches and demand repentance from many. Strange if the addressees were literal angels, end quote. And I would say I think that's, that's one of my biggest problems with this view is it doesn't really make sense to me why the letters would be addressed to angels and then call for repentance. Why would the angels be held responsible for the sins of members of the church? So... That's one of my big objections to this view. The star angel equation, star equals angel equation, also occurs in First Enoch, as one of the watchers is named Kokabel, star. And Bar Kokhba, the infamous character from the Jewish revolt, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, Kokhba, uh, Bar Kokhba, son of the star. So those are just a couple of uh, interesting footnotes there. The idea of angels as representatives or as guardians of earthly nations and communities is also found in Daniel 10. So if that's what John means, he would be once again drawing on Daniel 10. We've seen Daniel 10 come up a lot in Revelation. So if that's what's being communicated here, Daniel 10 would again be our Old Testament reference or one of them. We see a similar idea found in the uh, work known as Sirach, chapter 17, verse 17. It says, 
God appointed a leader for each nation, and Israel is the Lord's responsibility. Now that is in itself an echo of Deuteronomy 32.8. So Deuteronomy 32.8 worldview is found there in Sirach chapter 17. And many early church, uh, early Christian thinkers regarded the angels of the seven churches as the heavenly guardians of the churches. For example, Gregory Nazianzus, Origen, Basil, Hippolytus, and Eusebius all seem to have held this view, that the angels were the church's guardian angels, so to speak. But as I said, why the letters would be addressed to a supernatural being is still a mystery to me. Another issue is found in that the you in chapters 2 and 3 is sometimes singular and sometimes plural. Each letter is clearly not only addressed to the angel, but as David On points out, quote, the phenomenon of addressing a group as if it were an individual and using second person singular verb forms and pronouns is a widespread literary phenomenon, end quote. So that might answer that objection. But that still leaves the objection of why would these angels be accused of the sins of the churches or be responsible for those sins? That's what I've not heard a good explanation for from anybody who holds the angel um, being the angel of the churches being supernatural beings. The other main option is to view these angels as human messengers. And if human representatives are in view, I would suggest a parallel here with Malachi chapter 2 verse 7, which says, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger, and there it's Hebrew malach, or in the Septuagint angelos, angel. He is the messenger of Yahweh of hosts. And it surprised me when I saw David on also links to this same passage in his lengthy discussion about the identity of these angels. He also references Malachi 2.7. So even though there's not a touch point in the Septuagint, as far as I know, between the language of Malachi 2.7 and Revelation 1.20, I still like it as a parallel thought, as a potential um, connecting point there between the identity of the angels of the seven churches being... Um, some type of human representative of the Lord, as we see that uh, sometimes the prophets are called messenger or angel. And On has a note on this. He says, quote, Since the term angelos is used of human messengers of God, then it is arguable that the angelos of Revelation 2 and 3 are Christian prophets. Josephus observed that the Jews had received the holiest of their laws through messengers from God. Here he could be referring to angels, though as W.D. Davies has argued, the prophets are intended. Haggai 1.13 refers to Haggai, the messenger of the Lord. And their messenger is again Hebrew Malach and Septuagint Angelos, so angel. On continues, the term is also used of a prophetic messenger in the Septuagint of Malachi 1.1 and Malachi 3.1, end quote. And Malachi means my messenger. The Hebrew is Malachi. There are also rabbinic writings that state the prophets were called angels. Josephus even referred to himself as both a prophet and an angel. Some scholars also argue that the angels mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.16 are the apostles who witnessed the resurrection. Now, that, that's pretty wild. I'd never heard that before. So if that is a possible understanding of 1 Timothy 3.16, if that's not just totally out there, then that would be another place where the term angels is used to refer to the apostles. So after going through that, I my objection that I don't understand how the angels can be told to repent and be blamed to some extent for the sins of the churches, I don't, I don't see how that can work if they are supernatural beings. So I actually am in the minority here. I prefer to see them as some type of human, um, whether in the sense of the Old Testament prophets, you know, because what it, what was a prophet in the Old Testament? One of the prophets were those who were sent to speak the words of God. You know, we often think of prophets as those who predict the future, but the Old Testament, the prophets were the ones who communicated the words of God. You know, think of Elijah. When God sent him to talk to Ahab, he told he told him, go tell Ahab, you know, because you're wicked, this is going to happen. Or, 
you know, because of the wickedness of Jezebel, different things, of, you know, different messages like that, Elijah was sent to deliver. Elijah, you know, now he would predict the future at times, but he was more so sent to deliver Yahweh's message to the king. So it's my preference here to see these angels as the human messengers who are somehow the ones who are tasked with this, you know, job, maybe the ones who are reading it out loud. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't have the whole thing worked out as to, um, what I think the human messengers, who they were, you know, I, I, I do agree with, um, with Bollinger. I don't think we should be looking for like bishops or, you know, necessarily elders, you know, as on suggested, they could be Christian prophets. And that, I kind of like that. I don't know that we have strong evidence for that, other than linking it to um, Haggai and Malachi, when those two prophets were called Malachi, my messenger, or Malach, angel. Um, the other place that on that on cited, or I'm sorry, not on, well, he linked to Malachi two seven, and then I myself linked to that one as well, was when the priest was called the messenger, the angel. Um, so I don't know if that would be, you know, in a similar sense like the pastor. But I do prefer the, as I said, I do prefer to s some type of human there. I think it just makes more overall sense, at least for me, than seeing the angels of the churches as supernatural beings. But as I said, I am in the minority on that one. So, All right, let's briefly discuss, discuss the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. Uh, we've talked at quite a bit about lampstands in previous studies, so we're just going to mention a little bit here and then wrap this up. Uh, Mounts, he talks about the purpose of the lampstand, the purposes of the church, and he says, quote, the purpose of the church is to bear the light of the divine presence in a darkened world. Failing this, its reason for existence has disappeared, end quote. And he links that with Revelation 2.5, in which Jesus tells the church to repent, otherwise their lampstand will be removed. Also interesting that the equation of lampstands with churches is um, interesting when compared with Zechariah 4.10. As David Ahn notes, quote, The temple lampstands seen by Zechariah are accorded cosmic significance in Zechariah 4.10b, which says, These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. End quote. And Paul speaks of believers, the church, as being seated with Christ in the heavens or in the heavenly realms in Ephesians 2.6. So if on is correct to link Zechariah 4.10 with uh, this imagery in Revelation 1.20, then at minimum what we have is a divine council connection. Because uh, the cosmic significance of Zechariah 4.10, the seven are the eyes of the Lord. Again, if on is correct to link that with the seven lampstands in Revelation 120, then we have at minimum a divine council connection. So that is interesting. And that is the end of my notes on chapter one. Thank you for those of you who've gone with me through the entire chapter. God bless. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you all very soon.